All right, welcome everybody to the July 21st uh, DPW Commission meeting, the first meeting of the new fiscal year. Uh, I, as uh, director of the department, Chapin Spencer, will be running the beginning of the meeting until we get through the election of officers. So welcome everybody uh, virtually and those who are here in the room. Uh, our agenda is uh, as follows, we have a uh, call to order, uh, which I have done, uh, approving the agenda, the election of chair, vice chair, and secretary. Then there are a few consent items, no parking zone on Lakeside Avenue, the Cherry Street ad 15 minute parking space, Shelburne Street roundabout temporary ordinance change, two deliberative items, the sustainable infrastructure plan and FY22 draft goals and objectives. Approval of the draft minutes, director's report, and commissioner communications. So, um, we have two new commissioners with us tonight. I want to welcome Zoe Kennedy and Daniel Is it Motino. Um, welcome. We're pleased to have you uh, as new uh, commissioners. And uh, we operate with Robert's Rules of Order, so I'd welcome a motion uh, to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Great. I'll second that. Okay. Second by uh, Chair Hogan. Is there any adjustment to the consent agenda, team? We good? No. Okay. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those, uh, let's see. We have Commissioner Bowes uh, calling remotely. Is that correct? Yes. Great. So, all right, so uh, I'm going to just go uh, do a roll call. Uh, Dan Montano. Hi. Uh, Pablo Bose. Hi. Excellent. Uh, Brendan Hogan. Hi. All right, Peggy O'Neill. Hi. All right, Sylvia Overby. Hi. And Zoe Kennedy. Hi. All right, great. The agenda has passed. So, moving on to election of chair, vice chair, and uh, it says here secretary or clerk. Just a quick overview. Uh, the chair and the vice chair are the ones who facilitate the meetings uh, annually for the fiscal year that would start this meeting and continue to June. And then the clerk is responsible for the minutes. The clerk is allowed to be a staff uh, position and uh, we are uh, welcoming if the commission would like staff to continue with the minutes that you could uh, select uh, Val Ducharme uh, who is our customer service uh, representative. She's not here tonight, uh, but she uh, and Holly work on the minutes. So should you all want that to be delegated to staff, uh, you could uh, nominate uh, Val Ducharme for clerk. Any uh, nominations? I have a question. Like, Val's not here to, <laughs> it feels a little <laughs> weird to, to nominate Val without her being here if, if, yeah. if we know that she would consent to um, this nomination then. Sure. I mean, if, if, if friendly, you could, you could select uh, Rob Goulding uh, as, as the clerk and he could work with Holly and Val. Um, it is fine for us either way. Okay, so I'll nominate um, R Rob and Val. Is that a, or just has to be one person? Like just one person. Okay, Rob to work with Val and Holly. Yep. Okay. As Rob clerk. Goulding. As clerk. Yep. Okay. Uh, a, a nomination doesn't need a second. Are there any other nominations? Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, I will go through roll call again. Uh, Commissioner Montano. Aye. Commissioner Bowes. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hogan. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill Vivanco. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. And Commissioner Kennedy. Aye. All right. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Rob on that uh, <laughs> august appointment. <coughs> <laughs> on a technicality. <laughs> Got enough to. Active immediately. All right. Are there any nominations for chair and vice chair? I'd like to nominate Brendan Hogan as chair. Okay. Are there any other nominations for the position of chair? Uh, 
All right, hearing none, uh, I will, uh, any, any discussion? Tough competition. <laughs> <laughs> we have to ask whether you're willing to accept the uh, right. nomination. I would be willing to accept the nomination. Good, that is, that is helpful. Great, <laughs> any other discussion? All right, well then we'll go to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Montano? Aye. All right, Commissioner Bose? Aye. Commissioner Hogan? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill Vivanco? Aye. Commissioner Overby? Aye. And Commissioner Kennedy? Aye. All right, we're two thirds of the way done. Congratulations. <laughs> I would accept the nomination for vice chair. <laughs> Commissioner O'Neill Vivanco. No, I wanted you. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't read that? <laughs> All right, we have one nomination on the floor. Are there others? I'm going to work on my election. Commissioner O'Neill Vivanco, you're more than welcome to nominate someone if you'd like. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I would accept the nomination. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, any discussion? All right, we'll go to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Montano? Aye. Commissioner Bose? Aye. Commissioner Hogan? Aye. Commissioner Vonio Vivanco? Aye. Well done. Commissioner Overby? Overby, yes. <laughs> and Commissioner Kennedy? Aye. All right. Excellent. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks. You too. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> we'll get you yet, Pablo. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I have the uh, pleasure of passing the uh, virtual gavel over to uh, newly re-elected uh, Chair Hogan. Well, thank you, Director Spencer. Uh, the next item on our agenda is public forum. Um, do we have any members of the public Always. interested in speaking? No one uh, here or signed in to Zoom to speak. All right. That I'll close public forum. Okay. Moving forward to the consent agenda. Three items, no parking zone on Lakeside Avenue, Cherry Street, 15-minute space, and a temporary ordinance change for Shelburne Street roundabout. We welcome a motion on the consent agenda, if anyone is. In client. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. We have a, I'll second. We have a motion from Vice Chair Nivavaco and a second from Commissioner Muntanu. Very good, thank you. Is there any discussion around that motion? All right. Thank you, Charlie. All right, I think we are clear to go to a vote on the consent agenda. Uh, start with uh, Commissioner Muntanu. Aye. Right. Commissioner Bose. Aye. Thank you. Vice Chair O'Neill Vivanco. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. Commissioner Kennedy. Aye. Aye for myself. The consent agenda passes. Is everyone right? All right. Move forward to item six, Sustainable Infrastructure Plan 2.0. Welcome a staff communication. Yes, indeed. We're excited to uh, have Martha Keenan back uh, in her new role as a special projects coordinator. What's the official title? Capital and Special Projects Director. <laughs> Capital and Special Projects Director up at the Clerk Treasurer's Office. Uh, Martha has moved from DPW to serve uh, the entire city through her new role. We're really excited to have her in this new role, and uh, she's got a short presentation on our proposed capital plan. So you just have to speak. I just speak. I don't. Yeah. I share my So let's see if we can do this. I'm confident that we will figure it out. So how do I move that so that you don't see yourselves up there? There you go. Um, Does that it? And you'll just go into presentation mode. It's the bottom right, essentially. Yeah. Bottom right. 
right here? Yep. There you go. Well, it's kind of light, so my apologies. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I had the pleasure of coming here five years ago to discuss the first capital plan that was brought forward and was successful in creating a bond for $27.5 million to invest in our city's infrastructure. And first five years have flown by. We've gotten a lot done. And um, capital never stops going away, as I joke with Norm, is that it might stop when the potholes stop in your roads, and that's never going to happen. So we have capital for forever. And the capital plan itself is a snapshot in time. So you can take a look at it, and we create a plan. But in fact, it is a living document, and it changes and moves all the time. So. Um, we had a wonderful rain event last night, and capital projects come out of a rain event. So um, that's one really easy way to explain how, how evolving and spontaneous it can be in moving forward. So I'm going to look at what have we accomplished over the last five years, what did we learn from the last five years, and where are we going from here? Ooh, it worked. Um, <coughs> Um, so over the last five years, we improved over 14 miles of sidewalks. Prior to this bond that we received, we were averaging one mile of sidewalk work a year. We have since then been averaging three miles, and a more sustainable level is this three miles of sidewalk. We doubled our, side, our street reinvestment from $1 million a year to $2 million a year. And again, this is a more sustainable level. We still have, with the weather changes and the climate changes, we have our roads, when it freezes and thaws, they deteriorate faster. And so we need to invest more in keeping them going. We have rehabilitated seven miles of bike path. We have just 10% left. It's the North Beach area. There's a bridge there, North Beach overpass and that needs to be done to complete the bike path. Um, we've done a lot with facilities. We created a levee maintenance facility, um, which gave them a home and made it easier for them to help maintain the parks. We did a lot of um, HVAC envelope and roof work to improve the efficiency, energy efficiency of buildings as well as bring them up to standards, like we still have a long ways to go, but we have been working on those items particularly. We improved our IT infrastructure, and this helps both our employees and our citizens, and is going to allow us, we're going to have a new system in here for a hybrid meeting, so that it is easier for people to, to attend whether they are able to get here or not. Um, We've done a lot for security. We have uh, instituted an electronic door lock system, and we pulled together all of the video security systems into one system, and that system is now um, housed in dispatch at police. So if someone is called in and there's an event, let's say at City Hall Park, we'll use somewhere away from here, and the police have to respond, the dispatch can pull up the cameras and they can see what's going on and they can say, hey, there's a guy in a blue hoodie who's got a knife. He's on the left-hand side when you come around the corner. And that makes everything easier, safer for both the police and the people involved in it. They're walking into something and they have eyes that are helping them know what they're walking into rather than walking into blind and not knowing what's going on. Um, <clears throat> we have created an asset management committee, and asset management is a key to our whole capital plan. With asset management, we have an inventory, or we will have an inventory of all of our assets, and we will be able to input the work that gets done on, on them, what their condition is, and be able to make decisions as to replacement much better by knowing this on an ongoing basis basis and having it in one location. So this is going to help us maintain our plan and do better on our strategizing of our plan. We have um, 
improved on our one area we were sort of missing when we did the original capital plan was the public safety aspect of it. We didn't um, really include, not by intent of excluding them, but the police and fire department. And they have a lot of assets in the way of body cams, uh, cameras, um, and radios that help create a system throughout the city to uh, monitor things and to talk with each other. Um, and we just didn't have that included in our plan. And so in our new plan, we're making sure that we include those people in uh, the plan itself. Um, we've done uh, renovation here at 645 Pine and at City Hall. Both of those have improved security and made the systems, the visit for the public much better than it was previously. Um, and one of the things that's been really fun for me is we created a capital committee that is made up of different uh, general fund areas so that we're looking as a team at what does the city need and it, it's general fund based. So it's um, not covering water and BED in those areas, although we do talk and um, collaborate on things. And this is helping us with asset management to make sure that we're making the best use of our resources that we have. Um, and we also set up and implemented a fleet policy and strategy, and that is helping us. Uh, it used to be that every department ordered their own vehicles, and they decided what they wanted and how many they wanted. And with this new policy, it's all under the fleet manager, and he meets with each department, determines whether that's the right vehicle, and helps them with their specifications. Um, and as you know, we are moving towards a net zero energy goal. And so he has been uh, doing a lot of research on electric vehicles, hybrids, and where possible, we've been moving in that direction. So it's been really great. Just some pictures, so we've got a nice sidewalk painting on one side and the bike path on the other. Um, what have we learned out of this? That it's an evolution. And it's, I was at <coughs> NRG in a previous life and we believed in continuous improvement and lean. And so we are trying to make those changes here and, and continuously improve on what we're doing, how we do it, the efficiency of it, and to make good decisions that spend money the right way. And this evolution has helped us in that. Um, we also know that when we made our first plan, it wasn't complete, and we're still adding to it. <clears throat> Another area we didn't have was bridges. So the city actually has a lot of bridges, and they weren't in our original plan. So now we are including bridges, and we're including the, the radios and the police and fire items. So there's probably something else out there that we don't know about at this point. It always seems to show up at, at the worst time possible. It's when it fails that we find out that there's something out there. Um, we have a, a better understanding of the overall and competing needs that and are able to better prioritize them. There are tons of capital needs across the city. So um, we're just going to be speaking on a small part of it, but um, our, the overall plan is, is massive. And what we're looking at is what do we need in the next three years and what are the priorities that we should be attending to in the next three years when there are many more items that we need over the long haul. We have had a lot of deferred maintenance over many decades and we're trying to catch up at that at this point. And it took decades to get there. It's probably gonna take decades to get out of it as well. So it's, it's a process. One of the things that we, um, when the administration put out their 22 budget survey is that we learned that the public has a very strong uh, feeling of import for our infrastructure and taking care of it. So that was a great thing. Um, I always use this little car thing and it's somewhat silly, but if you buy a car, you have to maintain it on an ongoing, so there's operating expenses to it. And then there's some long-term maintenance, like you've got to do brakes and you've got to m maybe change other things. But then you also have to plan to replace it. And so the capital plan is planning to replace it. 
but we're helping on those other items at the same time. So if we do our job correctly, we're going to lower the operating costs. And by people doing the correct repairs and maintenance in a timely fashion, they're going to lower our capital costs. So we have to have a collaborative synergistic relationship between our operating and our capital to make it work. So what are our next steps? We're working on presenting our next three years of the capital plan. And I chose, um, and we chose three years at this point because three years you can truly plan and you have a good idea of what you can do and what is out there. When you go to four and five, you can have plans, but there's a high likelihood that something's going to change in year four and five. And so being really specific in that time period is difficult. And so we're concentrating on three years at this point. I'm meeting with all the commissions, all the NPAs, um, all of the committees uh, over the summer. Uh, on the 9th of August, we'll be meeting with the Board of Finance and City Council to let them hear about all of this. And we're looking from all of these conversations to educate and bring uh, approval to the City Council in September to go for a bond in November. Um, and that will be a special election on the 9th of November. And we have to, along the way, we have lots of needs. We need to prioritize those needs and make sure through this education and these conversations that we are picking the correct needs and prioritizing everything correctly. We can always learn something better and do our job better through communication. Um, at the same time, we have to strategize. There's a lot of new funding coming out this year. So there's ARPA funds. ARPA funds, um, there is an input system that CARA is doing through the uh, CEDO and Community Economic Development that is taking input on that. ARPA funds are relatively restrictive as far as the capital that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's mainly on broadband and water uh, and sewer electric, not electric, input. So. Um, it has a use and uh, it is a possibility for some, but it doesn't deal with a lot of our capital that we're talking about tonight. The state um, has two different sets of funding in their budget this year that are potential opportunities for us. One is on infrastructure, which specifically may tie to bridges, our streets and sidewalks. And so if that opportunity arises and we can take advantage of that, then we don't need to ask the voters for money for that. So um, we want to make sure that we are looking at the opportunities and using our money where we need to and then use other people's money where we can. The same item goes for the climate change um, funds is that climate change covers a lot of different things. So it could be the HVAC and controls for your building. It could be envelopes, it could be windows. Um, but it could also be EV chargers. And so you can't get a electric vehicle fleet if you don't have the means of keeping it charged. So you need that infrastructure. And uh, for the way vehicles are used in this city, um, they need to be able to charge relatively quickly. So you need a, a tier three charger, um, which can charge a vehicle in a couple of hours. And those are, of course, more expensive than your other chargers. They're about $80,000 a piece. And so we're hoping that we can get three in this coming year through using this climate change funds um, and have one in each part of the city, so downtown, north, and south, um, and make that available to people. It can also create some revenue because most times you can uh, set up that it, people can put their credit card in for it and charge for it. So if somebody was coming from Montreal or Hanover and wanted to go to the waterfront and they wanted to drive their electric vehicle, they could actually park and charge and be able to get back home again. So we are working on that. Um, and then there's the federal infrastructure bill that originally was $2 trillion. It's being trimmed, but it has. A, it's the first time in 
probably five years that there has been the dollars available or will be the dollars available from the federal government and we want to take as much advantage of them as we possibly can. So while we're going through all of this process, we are working to understand what's a sustainable level of investment in our capital. What do we need on an annual basis and then what are the things that are going to come up that will need a, a greater investment over time. So um, here we have broken out the items that we know are an annual investment and um, so this sidewalk invest, reinvestment of 1.7 million is three miles of sidewalks a year. And that is what we have determined we need at this point to get to the correct turnover of and maintenance of our sidewalks. On our street, it's an additional $700,000 a year um, to make sure, and that's above and beyond what's in our street capital funding. So there is a tax that goes, it's 2% that is put towards street capital every year and that's about $2.3 million. In order to maintain our streets, we believe properly, we need an, an additional 700,000 a year. Um, we have our IT infrastructure. Brian Lowe, um, before he left, gave us a nice three-year um, presentation and budget for what we needed and that averages out at $300,000. Um, for transportation planning, this is an annual budget, and um, prior to our bonding, uh, the transportation planning at $125,000 a year. And as you probably know, Nicole comes and speaks with you quite often, and there are a lot of uh, means and desires to improve our bike ped and our transportation. And this is just the beginning of what is needed. Like, there are other projects there are two projects that are budgeted this year to do uh, separate streets and that were the public had asked for. And so this is just to keep her going on her projects. She does a lot of CCRPC work and that covers matches, it covers pavement markings, uh, landscaping. Traffic calming. Traffic calming, thank you. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, it, that's a, a small number, but it keeps her going and keeps our initiatives moving forward. Capital project management. Um, this covers salaries in um, parks, DPW, and uh, clerk treasures, and uh, CEDO. And so this is what we have been spending on project managers for the past three years. And if we want to continue our work, uh, we need to continue investing in, in the people to do the work. Um, facilities, parks projects, both have annual needs and we're still refining those more. Um, facilities has, uh, we did a condition assessment in 2017. And so we have one, but it's outdated. And so with our asset management, we're looking at updating that condition assessment and having a better number, but we have a number of buildings that need roofs, that need new boilers, that um, uh, we didn't have one building 200 Church Street um, for a number of years, and it needs a new roof, it needs a new HVAC system, and it needs new windows. So there are, they just continue to come. Buildings are like streets. They have their own potholes. Um, Parks Project, um, the Parks Department is great and they have done a master plan and that master plan is, um, goes out 10 years and has, for instance, just for North Beach, about $4 million that needs to be done at North Beach in the master plan. And then they have um, one for Oak Ledge. And so um, this is just um, the items that they feel are most important right now. Um, it would cover the harbor marina and dredging it. The boathouse is sinking. The barge that it's on is sinking and the whole thing needs to be replaced. So it is to keep those items going. Um, in the 
fleet policy, we have been doing a strategy of master leases each year. Some of the vehicles that we, or equipment that we buy, have a life of 10 years or more, like our snow plows and our sidewalk tractors. And so it would actually be beneficial to bond for those rather than to put them in a master lease that is a shorter time frame and a higher interest rate. So we are doing a combination of those two items. Um, our public safety, this is really a larger uh, one-time number right here, is that the uh, citywide public infrastructure radio system is at end of life and the um, cost to replace it is $5.3 million. So uh, it's a big number, but it, it will be once in probably 15 years. They will continue to have some other costs of uh, their radio system and the radios themselves that have to be replaced, their body cameras, um, their defibrillators, I can't say the word, um, that will continue to need to be replaced. But those are not as large as this one item that we have. All of these lovely items come up to a, around $30 million. Um, our annual need, and, and this is where we're still working on this a little bit, the annual need is really closer to $7 million if you were to, to average out your facilities, your parks, and it, it would potentially be closer to 10 million. So we're trying to figure out what that sustainable number is and still working that out. But um, easily just on these items, it's $4 million. And right now the capital program gets $2 million a year. So it was it started at 1 million in 2009 and in 2012 it went to 2 million and we haven't had an increase since 2012. So we really know that on a sustainable lever, level, we need to go a hot, to a higher number. There are lots of other capital needs. Um, we try to leverage wherever possible and use other people's money. And some examples of that are the Rail Yard Enterprise Project, the Parkway, Shelburne Street Roundabout, the rail realignment, and there are tons of other little grant projects that are out there. Washington Berry was one. Um, and so we will leverage our money wherever we possibly can. And that helps us, those projects themselves are well over $70 million if you put them all together. And we are putting out around $5 million. So that's a pretty good return on your investment. Um, we have a number of master plans. We have the bike ped master plan, the parks one, our scoping and corridor studies that we've done. And they all have a lot of work that is thought of and is in, uh, are in our overall plan. And obviously we can't get to all of these at this time. So we have to really prioritize. Um, there are a number of departments that have been doing large revisioning and, and other projects. The library has a large uh, revisioning and they just sent out their RFP for their schematic design today. Um, the estimate on that um, is around $22 million. Uh, the fire station did a study and they found that they could be uh, as efficient by consolidating two of their stations into one. Uh, the fire stations, um, there are two very historic buildings that take a lot of maintenance. The one up on Mansfield Ave is uh, 1895 and it's the oldest running fire station in the state. And then our fire station number one, it was built in 1928. And, um, needs a lot of work uh, to maintain it and the retaining wall around it. So it's built on top of the um, ravine. And so uh, it is sort of settling. Uh, we replaced the ramp there and when we replaced it, we found areas where there had been tree trunks before and they had deteriorated and then you have air pockets. So it's, it needs some work. Um, at the same time, there are operational and maintenance needs that go with all of this. And we, again, that's that collaboration and synergy that we need to create with 
pavement markings, landscaping, facilities maintenance, all of those items, we have to coordinate it to get the best dollar um, value for everything that we do. So some considerations. We have a debt policy cap. Um, and right now, our cap for the general fund, over, overall, our cap is at $110 million approximately. And 30 of that is available to the general fund. And so I'm basically asking for the max that we now have available. Um, and so that's why it's so important that we look at what our other funding opportunities are out there and take advantage of them. We are hoping that we'll request um, and that the public will be behind a general obligation bond in November. And we're working on a strategy that will create a sustainable plan to maintain a vibrant downtown and make people want to come to Burlington and spend their money in Burlington because it, that is a part of keeping it vibrant is to bring people in and have people enjoy what we have in the city. And the longer we defer our repairs, the more it's going to cost, unfortunately. And that's part of our problem right now. Uh, the schedule, there's a lot of meetings. I'll be coming back to you with a request in August. Um, right now, this is just informational and educational. Um, our goal is um, on September 13th to have the City Council approve going to the voters for a bond in November and a special election on November 9th. That's it. Questions? Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Overby, you want to get the light just so we can. Uh, ah, there we cool. go. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Any else from the, the staff side? We're happy to discussion. answer questions, have a dialogue. This is really, we wanted to do a two-step process, as Commissioner Archibald often liked to do, yeah. um, and really give the commission some time to dig into this before next month we seek your uh, recommendation to the council if you're so inclined to support the request for bond, uh, bond vote and bond funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's start on the phone with this one. Uh, Commissioner Bowes. The Comments, questions? Uh, yeah, just, just a quick question. So what is going to be coming back to us um, for the next meeting, the actual cost that's going to be going to city council? Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, is that we will be requesting that you recommend to the city council going uh, to the voters for a general obligation bond in November uh, for $30 million. And we'll have the language of that request provided prior to the Great. You will. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Mutanu. So the term sustainability comes up a lot. Um, in, in what ways <coughs> is that the case? It's not just keeping the actual, like, public, I guess, goods in, in working order and everything. I mean, I hope it's kind of beyond that. So yes, there are multiple ways of using sustainability. So one side is that we're trying to develop a sustainable plan that we can maintain f into perpetuity. <coughs> Got it. Um, and the other is that the city has a goal of being net zero energy by 2030. And so these two tie very strongly together. And so as we are looking at these items, we work closely with BED on our facilities and work, and actually with Vermont Gas as well. They have a new group of people in Vermont Gas who are very tuned into energy efficiency. And so we um, meet with them on a monthly basis and talk about projects and what we can do and they provide incentives and rebates to us, both of them, um, to help our buildings go towards a net zero energy. Our fleet, um, we're working on that as well, of electrification where we can. Um, some items, like there still is an electric snowplow that will work in, in Vermont. Um, I think they do have them now, but some of the challenges are that going up and down the hills um, and the amount of time, oftentimes our plows will work 24 hours at a time. There just isn't an electric battery that's going to keep that going. 
Um, so we're looking at that and delving into it all of the time. Um, there are a number of parking lots that have pervious payment at this point, and so we're looking at that as well. Um, and you will hear when water comes to you because water is in the same boat um, and is a continuing investment in it. They've been doing a number of green um, projects to help the rainwater and stormwater go and be useful. Um, and I can't speak more on that because I'm not educated enough on it. Um, but it's pretty fascinating what they're doing. So um, all of it is to become more sustainable, reduce our carbon footprint overall for the city, become net zero energy. Transportation planning is a part of that. The more we can get people on bikes and walking, that helps. Um, using electric buses that, and using more transportation of that mean, getting people out of cars is going to help as well. Thank you. Any, anything else in here? No, oh, that's good, thank you. All righty, thank you. Tremendous. Vice Chair Nibavaka. Um, the question about the, the timing of state, federal, and federal infrastructure funds, and you talked about leveraging those. Any idea how that, how, you know, are you in conversations with federal delegation on that or the House or state uh, on the local level? Um, so I'm working with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Mm -hmm. So Karen Horn and I speak weekly, and they actually hired a person to manage the ARPA funds as well and to help municipalities use their funds correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Scott was actually in Washington last Friday and met with Biden and uh, was talking about uh, both the ARPA funds and the county funds that uh, Vermont has not yet gotten and also the larger infrastructure bill. So um, I'm working with all those folks on it. I'm working with CARA on the uh, ideas for the use of the ARPA funds at this point as well. Um, so it is sort of a, it, it, it's squishy because, um, that's a very technical term. Technical, yes. <laughs> um, but we don't want to go to bond for three bridges and then have the federal funding. And so we're trying to stay right on top of it. and. The money that is in the state, the, the state had 160,000, uh, 160 million, excuse me, that's for infrastructure for this year that will be available. And they have not yet put out how we can apply for those funds. They have 59 million for climate change. Mm -hmm. So both of those items, I'm just like constantly, and I actually went into their budget yesterday and got lost. but. Um, trying to maintain and, and keep contacts. I've, I've reached out to uh, the director uh, at the state to see if I can get any timeline of when they'll be making this available for us and what the restrictions and specifications are. So it is a little squishy, It is, a, um, but we are trying to keep an open mind to what might be available have those sort of in a pile over here, and then the things that we absolutely have to do, no matter what, are over here, and um, keep to that list. Okay, and then just a follow-up then. So we can anticipate some pot of, you know, I'm just imagining like these dump trucks of money coming into Vermont. <laughs> Electric dump trucks. Um, uh, and so we can anticipate the, you know, Burlington having access to some of these state and federal, like the, the big federal infrastructure at some point. Um, so this this bond has nothing to do with that, but in the plan of um, where we need to kind of prioritize, then that second tier of priorities might be covered by some of this. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. You said it better than I could. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That's all, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Overby. Um, I know I've been in communication yep. with you, and I'll follow up a little bit on some of the details that you explained just now. I, I know you're very much a detailed person, and this is a very complicated thing to try to, to do. And I, 
I appreciate your work and what we, you did la you know four years ago, five years ago. So I just want to let you know that I'm I, I feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I appreciate your diving in and doing it. And I look forward to getting some of the details behind some of these numbers to um, clarify some of it. I did have a couple of specific questions. One of the things overall, I, I'm a little I'm, I'm a little bit um, concerned about the fact that we've got this is a bond that's coming down the pipe. The water resources is going to be looking for money. The high school is going to be looking for money, and if everybody got their tax bill today, like I did, there's going to be some interesting um, uh, uh, discussions that are going to have to be had, you know, and uh, to, to help people out with this. And um, not that these, I, I mean, I think these are important things. I mean, you know, we look at what happened with the building that fell down in Miami, which was sort of a, a, a similar situation of lack of that kind of planning and, and getting too late in the planning. Um, with the catastrophe happening. So I, I feel like we're sort of, um, I, I'm, the more information and the, and the better you can ex, you know, explain, not in giant numbers to people, the important value that is received from what we're paying for, it's gonna be so much easier for people to swallow each of those incremental um, additional uh, charges. And um, so, when the when the when the information is put out for the bond, I think it probably ends up with something like how much that's going to add to the tax rates for the state. I mean, the city's rate, I assume, just so people, based on the, what happened to my tax bill, I'm I'm sure people are going to be in um, in quite a bit of pain already. Um, so that's just something important that we're going to have to think about. Not that your projects aren't important the way you're doing it. So the more they're credible and explainable. That's important. It, it could be problematic, um, some of those items. So I think we may need to, you know, you think about prioritizing. We may need to look at some of those and go, mm. yep. you know what I mean? I, I don't know. But specific questions about this. You had said that, that some of it's for IT infrastructure. Is, um, are you able to now be able to put out year-to-date balances for the capital projects through the New World accounting system? Because I know um, one of the one of the concerns has been, been money that goes into different places and then comes out of different places and then there's reconciliation sort of to, you know, make it look like the money's all you know spent the way it was supposed to, using spreadsheets. And I have a big concern about the lack of sort of clarity on. So so I'm really concerned. Are you able to? Is that part of this infrastructure improvement to make sure that that happens? And are you able to do that with the work that you're doing now? So we instituted project um, accounting this past year, and um, this will be the end of our first year in project accounting, which will allow us to run much better reports. The other um, a part of that is that each different revenue goes in in a different line, and it's fully funded at the beginning of the project. And so if that project is completed, then you close it out and those revenues go back to be spent on another project. Previously, it wasn't as clean as that. And so now we can run balances and we aren't done with our reconciliation for it will probably be October before we're totally done. But um, we can run reports on each of those projects of what has been spent of which funds and what the balances are for them. So that is a much better step forward. Uh, additionally, we are looking at a capital forecasting software to be able to put all of these projects into and then be able to do what ifs. So if we do this, it will have this effect on us. And um, we will not from that, but we did last time uh, create a document that showed what it w each different vote would do to your tax bill. So if it was approved that for the average median household, it would do this. Um, and I think that people found that very helpful last time. And so we will be doing that again this time as part of our information. I do see that it could be a real challenge and therefore that's why there's this huge list of people to talk to is that educating people and getting out there and making sure that they understand why it's important and what we're doing and um, where that need comes from. Um, you know, we can't go back in time. It's where it is, and uh, you can't really put, you don't want to 
place any blame anywhere. It just is what it is right now and we need to move forward. And so presenting that and putting the best foot forward that we possibly can and letting people understand we are using their money in the most efficient, best manner for the lower cost of use that we possibly can. And so yes, you have very good points and they are true. And, and I think the details will help people to feel like it's a good investment. Sidewalks, I don't think anybody complains about. But, but you know, things like dredging the harbor, people might say, you know, I don't have a sailboat out there. So that might not be a top priority. But anyway, yeah, just, but you know what I mean, so the details. It's a revenue earner for that's the okay. city. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that I have talked to, particularly parks, about, is that they have a lot of different revenue areas. And so if there are projects that they can do that will increase their revenues and help the city, then we should do those projects first and um, prioritize it in that order. And so, you know, being able to show that the reason we're investing in this is that it's going to increase our revenues by this amount, um, and therefore the return on investment is that much better. That is key to making it worthwhile. Yeah, that well, that has to be just information to the public so they can get that. Otherwise, it would it would look on the surface of you know, providing a, a, a service for people that are wealthy and not the rest of the community. So that's, a, you know, you've got to figure out how to sell that. Um, the fleet management thing, it has the, the fact that there's a fleet manager making decisions about, you know, all the fleet purchases, has that actually reduced the number of vehicles that we now um, own and lease in Burlington? Well, actually, no. <laughs> um, it's reducing the growth. It's reducing the growth. We have actually uh, added a couple of vehicles simply because we added this urban patrol this year um, in uh, for the park areas and we got electric bicycles for them so we increased we considered those part of our fleet um, it has enabled us to uh, turn our vehicles in a better way so we had more money come from trade-ins and sales of vehicles this year than we ever have because in the past we have driven vehicles until they have no value and now we are getting we are trading them at a time when they still have a value but they are costing more in maintenance than it's worth so um, we're able to do that uh, analysis of is it time to get rid of the vehicle and we're getting more equity for it when we do so it is helping in that means it's not actually uh, reducing the number of vehicles um, when we had a consultant come in and unfortunately there were not a lot of vehicles to get rid of are is there sharing of vehicles between departments now is there more sharing because of this uh, fleet manager there is. role yes so that's a good thing that that you don't have vehicles sitting around um, so that's an important value to that um, can you just explain the debt policy cap um, there's obviously it's like when you go to borrow money as a homeowner, you have a limit of how much your you know your debt load is. Is something like that for the city? I, I didn't quite get what you how you explained that. What how much we're, we're we've borrowed already in our debt load and what we 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 can whatever legally borrow. borrow. So about three years ago, when CAO uh, Anderson was uh, here, uh, they went to council and created an ordinance for what the ceiling was for what the city could comfortably borrow. And so that is our debt capacity cap. So, um, and I believe it was $195 million. Um, please don't, um, I do have some documents on it, but I'm talking off the top of my head. Am I close, Chapin? Uh, it looks like 290. Or, 290. Yeah, something like that. So thank you for not quoting me. Um, <laughs> but um, oh, that uh, is. Yes, you're right, 209 for maximum city and BSD debt. Yes. Okay, that was close. Good, thank you. Um, so it's split between the schools and the general fund for this. The enterprises have revenue bonds, so those don't tie and don't go into our debt capacity. Um, and so they set that three years ago um, as it was Moody's recommendation. And uh, we have been working with that, but we do have some major challenges coming up. And so uh, whether there will be any uh, change to that, I can't say. But, but does that mean 
$209 million a year that we can borrow that's each year, debt, no, or that's, that's the grand total, total that we total carry for debt? Total long-term debt of general fund borrowing. Okay, and so, how, so right now we have how much general fund long-term debt? Around $107 million for a balance of $103 million. But so, so you're right now we're only halfway to our, our debt capital. Correct. Except. However, <laughs> the key issue is that the lion's share of the available debt is within the school district, and that is to accommodate the high school. So uh, we, on the general fund side, only have an availability of approximately $30 million left until we I, hit the debt. So 107 seat. of the 209 million, sorry to be, I'm dense here. Uh, so 209 million of the cap for the schools and the city. Yep. We have borrowed 109 million. Is that us or the school? It's a combination. Okay, combination. so, and then the other 100 million you're saying is except 30 million of it is for the so, school like that extra 70 that yeah. was the that we already sort of recognized okay okay so yeah. so we actually are already approved another 70 million of that limit which we just haven't done anything with we haven't drawn I got it, down. it. Right. okay so that makes sense we've got I, I think I get that yeah. okay so we're just that's where we're you will want to have another approval of the final 30 million that is up to our limit correct okay and then we can figure out how much that's going to cost us which is what you're going to work out all right yeah I think for that, for the moment, those are my questions, and I can follow up with more later. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kennedy. Okay. So I'm new at this, so I don't have as many in-depth questions. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, and I, yeah, I guess the only question that I really have is regarding, like, the electrification of the city's fleet. Um, it's my understanding that like 30% of our electricity comes from the biomass plant and would like the, that electricity for the fleet be like tapped into the power grid here or would it be like its own supply? Because how sustainable can that really be when biomass is increasingly being so proven to be less sustainable? BED is looking at change, you know, continually. Like they're looking at whether biomass is going to stay or go. Um, they're looking at district heating. Um, the challenge with electrifying your fleet is that it adds to your electric bill. It is not um, adding to your carbon footprint, however. So you're taking away, and you know, the best thing would be and is if there were no more gas stations, the gas stations you pull up and there's an electrical charging, but there's a cost to that as well. It's just that electricity is less harmful to the environment and is less expensive than gas long term. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is going to um, put a burden on BED and their uh, renewables by increasing the electrical usage overall in the city. That is a correct assumption. Okay. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I guess that's all I really had to ask because um, I'm still, still learning here, but. <laughs> no. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like we we'll get another uh, get another look at it uh, next month. I expect. Yeah. Um, thank you. Just uh, a couple of questions on, on my end. Is your expectation? Oops, my apologies. Uh, after, if this gets approved for a, a three-year bond here, um, do you have a sense of where you want to be at the end of that three years? Like, is it, is it are, are we caught up at that point and under general funds? Or We're never we? caught up. So that, I, I think that we, part of my education is that we have a long way to go. And um, so what we're trying to come up with, what would be, it would be much easier to have a sustainable amount each year that we get bonded for. That $2 million is not sufficient. So my goal would be is that over the three-year period, we really firm up what that number is and we go back and get approval for a number on an annual basis that we get to manage the capital plan with. Mm -hmm. And then if there was a large project such as the library or the fire station or consolidated collection that we go back for that individual request and that would be specific to the project. But that the normal work 
would come out of a, a an annual request that would be approved once by the voters and continue. Yeah, makes sense, thank you. And suppose, I understand um, there's a lot still in the works about the other potential funding, but, but suppose some of that comes through with overlap of our goals here. Is your expectation that you would then ask for like 25 million instead of 30, or we just do different things with our limit of 30? Yeah, we would, we would probably stay at the 30 million and get to the other projects that we're deferring in this request that we're making now. Mm -hmm. okay. But that is ultimately a guidance that you all and other commissions, when you see, as Commissioner Overby suggested, you know, the cost for the average taxpayer, uh, we do have to balance this with the additional water needs and the, uh, as I understand, BED is interested in coming with a net zero uh, revenue bond as well. So there are going to be multiple pressures that we're going to have to balance as we evaluate our move forward. And just, um, I, I think I heard you that the, the bonding that our water, wastewater and stormwater department is under is from a separate pool and does not count against this. Correct. It's a revenue bond, and they don't go against our debt capacity. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of the, like, for example, the transportation planning budget? Like, looks great now. I guess I don't know familiar these numbers, but I mean, how does that compare to what we what we spent on the the last five year sustainable We've infrastructure? Been spending the four hundred sixty thousand a year plus other projects that came along that became construction projects. So many times she will start a project, get it through design, and then it will become a capital project from there. And then that capital project gets funded. So when I was speaking with Nicole, in her um, bike ped master plan, there's over $200 million worth of projects that could be done that came out in the plan. Mm -hmm. And so again, this 460 is allowing her to go to CCRPC and leverage money there and do design and um, beginning projects and then a lot of the uh, quick pop-ups and the traffic calming come out of her 460,000. So it's a stepping stone to an actual capital project. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, nothing else on my end. Appreciate the, the back and forth here. Um, we'll check on uh, public forum. Is there any members of the public? There is nobody uh, signed up for public comment. Great. Thanks for the check there. That said, uh, I think we're all set here, right? We are not seeking any action on this item at this time. All right, thanks so much. I will close out uh, item six on our agenda. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. the presentation. And as with Solve, if you have questions, please feel free to email and just copy Chapin so that he knows what you're <laughs> looking for. He likes to get his inbox filled. <laughs> yeah, sure he has no trouble with that. <laughs> all right, thanks all. Thank, Thank you. Very um, much. Moving forward, item seven on our agenda drafts, fiscal year 22 goals and objectives. Great. Thank you. Um, Part of our conversation uh, tonight was uh, having quick and snappy meetings. Uh, so uh, new fiscal year, set new, uh, new protocols new and expectations, right? <laughs> so um, I did hand out and we will be posting uh, online for the public to see our draft goals. Um, my thought tonight is to just give you a really quick five minute overview so you can spend the time between now and next month, and then we can have a more substantive conversation next month. These goals for the new commissioners are advisory. They are to help you and the public understand you know, the departmental's priorities. This is an opportunity for you to kind of help direct the priorities of the uh, department. And it's also, from what we understand from the commissioners, a useful tool when we are evaluated annually. Uh, City Engineer Baldwin and, and, and I are uh, serving in appointed positions and uh, your commission is, uh, is asked to review our performance and uh, submit uh, comments to the, to the mayoral 
office and then they determine whether or not to reappoint recommend us for reappointment so if this tool is helpful for that all the better so uh, I will just share the screen uh, here and we will make this very quick so similar to years past uh, maybe we want to turn the light off again just for yeah for ease all right great so uh, as in years past uh, for some reason I'm trying to scroll up um, that's what I used to oh there we are great uh, we have three operational goals that we have uh, used as our North Stars for, um, for my tenure here. Operational excellence, exemplary customer service, and a culture of innovation. And then what we've identified is particular annual objectives that we as a department want to focus on in service to those goals. We've also listed in the FAR column here the commission role in uh, those activities. So I will not go through all of them. I think what I'll do is hit the DPW-wide objectives, which are the kind of top seven or eight, and then we can uh, review the rest uh, uh, at your pleasure and happy to answer any questions. So um, one of the major initiatives that we are uh, bringing to an exciting watershed moment this year is our asset management program. The capital planning that Martha presented on and the capital reinvestment are matched peas in a pod with asset management. This, the asset management is the maintenance of the vehicle once we've already purchased it, and then the capital improvements uh, are the replacement or major upgrades of the vehicles. Um, so we are planning to go live with our asset management program this year. We have procured a software. We are in the middle of implementing and training our teams. This is a software tool that will identify every asset within our control from pumps at a sewer plant to vehicles that we have to sections of pavement um, that we will be able to identify to sewer main segments, uh, the maintenance schedule on those assets, the age of those assets, the condition of those assets, and all the work we have done historically on that to give us the information. Do we need to reline an asset? Do we need to replace it, uh, et cetera? So we are launching this new computerized maintenance management system this year. We are extremely excited. And uh, that will give us more up-to-date data that we can share with you in the public much more quickly. Uh, second is something you heard about tonight, which was close the capital funding gaps. One of the responsibilities we need to do to ensure the resiliency of our system is to uh, be able to plan for these major upgrades and to help the community understand when we need them and to get approval for, uh, for those projects. So tonight you've heard about the general fund. Our plan is to be uh, with you in the coming months to talk about the water, wastewater and stormwater reinvestments. And we have been very successful together in the past five years thanks to the partnership between staff and the commission in making a generational reinvestment. But unfortunately, as you heard tonight, we continue to need to do that work. We are not over the hump. Third is enhanced growth opportunities within the department. Uh, it is important to me that we build a sustainable organization and people are its most valuable asset. So how many of our hires for managers, uh, working foremen, foremen, are from within? Are we training our teams? Are we giving them the support to grow in our organization? We have had a number of internal promotions lately. I'm very pleased with that. Um, but we want to uh, have a clear metric of understanding how many staff are getting professional development opportunities and how many internal promotions uh, are we able to bring every year. Fourth is increased engagement of underrepresented constituencies. Uh, thanks to Public Information Manager Rob Goulding and uh, many on our staff, we have done a much better job at reaching out to the public and engaging the public. We also have a new equity toolkit, racial equity toolkit that the Racial Equity Inclusion and Belonging Department has uh, developed. And so we need to implement uh, our efforts and implement the toolkit's use and evaluate each of our new programs before we launch them to make sure we understand that it is not disproportionately impacting 
any uh, vulnerable constituencies. Uh, number five here is reduce injuries. Uh, we are a, uh, a department that does a lot of uh, construction work uh, and field work. And it's not easy work, and um, many of the positions uh, are exposed to significant risks. So uh, we have successfully knocked down the number of recordable injuries that we have had every year. We, uh, about five years ago, were averaging somewhere between 17 and 21 recordable injuries. Last year, we were down around 10. Our goal this year is to be at uh, 10 or fewer uh, for this year. So obviously safety has got to be our top priority. Um, number six, expand preventive maintenance program. Uh, this is a, uh, together with the asset management program, this is carrying out the recommendations and to do more preventative maintenance. Um, some preventive maintenance we are doing a decent job at, but we have a number of pieces of infrastructure, railings, fences, uh, guardrails that aren't on a regular maintenance program that really need to be. And so while we have a fleet department, equipment maintenance focusing on fleet, there are different assets within the city that don't have the same attention and care and we need to turn our attention there. Uh, seven, provide effective coordination with private projects. Last uh, division wide goal. We only have so much capacity in the city and we need to harness the energy uh, and the talents of our property owners, our residents, uh, our businesses, so that we can grow together. And uh, we are very fortunate to have a number of uh, large private projects, uh, Cambrian Rise, Cambria Hotel, uh, Bove, City Place uh, Development, and, and many others. Uh, it, the, even the Amtrak project, which is being led by the state, but we need to coordinate we need to be an effective partner in supporting those projects. So I won't go through the rest of them, but I'm happy to answer any initial questions uh, and what we may have missed or we need to emphasize more as we're looking to FY22. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Um, are we gonna bucket to flip the lights? Lights? Um, yeah. <laughs> Need to well, I guess we have paper copies. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah. Let's open up to uh, questions and, yeah. and dialogue here while we, we've got everybody. Um, let's start uh, with Commissioner Mutano. Yeah. I want to talk about number four, uh, outreach to underrepresented communities. In what ways does the department currently uh, just reach out about projects and stuff? Yeah. And sort of how is this going to change in the coming year? Great question, do you want me to yeah. take? Yeah, so one of the first things that we've tried to do over the last, I'd say two years, is increase what, what um, our capacity is to do outreach to uh, communities that may have ling linguistic barriers, which is arguably the maybe the largest one we face, as well as some, some cultural barriers to engaging with government. So um, one of the things we've tried to do is for really, um, you know, citywide, uh, uh, let me back up, uh, for, for events that are kind of regular recurring and that have citywide impact, we've tried to take a hard look at what we have the capacity to get materials at least translated into um, things like snow bands, things like uh, clean sweep. These are important citywide events, but there's also for parking ban safety impacts, there are also financial impacts that residents will, will suffer if they don't have the information about a snow ban. Now we do have through ordinance the, the notification tool, which is the, the lights. But you know, if you're a new resident, if you're a long-standing resident and haven't paid attention to municipal government, you may not know about the lights. So we've taken the opportunity to get all of that material translated into, I think it's uh, five or six languages right now. We're targeting another four languages for all of our translation material as we've learned a little bit more about um, some of the best practices and some of the more commonly spoken languages in Burlington, working with a couple partners um, in city government, but also with the Burlington School District, we have learned and gotten more data about what you know what those really key nine languages in Burlington are. Like I said, we started with five or six. So snow bands, uh, clean sweep, these bring $125 tickets. So while we want people knowing about the work we do, we also don't want them. So so there are tons of projects we would love to kind of translate material, distribute material in. 
it's really these things that we just don't want people suffering the financial penalty um, because of language barriers. So we've taken a look at a couple things like that. Um, one, of the, one of the first things we did um, get translated were our boil water advisories and our mandatory boil water um, events. Luckily, we've only had two in, in recent city history. They came re relatively close together, mostly based on a change in state law that required kind of a different threshold for notifications. But once we had the first one, which was regional, we decided, you know, we can't have that happen again and not be able to communicate even more effectively with all of uh, Burlington residents. So for, um, for the next one, which was, uh, I think it had become a citywide boil water advisory, we were well positioned with those, I think it's five or six languages to distribute to the community. Um, another thing we've tried to do is take a look at which projects bring a high level of interest or a high level of uh, controversy. And so for the Champlain Parkway, we've had now two meetings um, where we decided, you know, we're gonna have, not only are we gonna get the material translated, but we're also gonna have interpreters on site and so we had, um, for a, a citywide Champlain Parkway meeting in September of 2019, I think we had interpretation, on-site interpretation for five or six um, uh, languages that we had identified as being key to the project corridor. Um, you know, the next step here, as Director Spencer mentioned, is there's an a racial equity toolkit that the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department has put together that we're evaluating closely and looking at kind of how to implement that with them so that we know how to kind of evaluate what projects need to be um, looked at from an equity lens, uh, potentially bringing in language, cultural, or other things that we may need to keep in mind. Uh, there's also a language access plan that was passed by the City Council that was mostly uh, spearheaded by CEDO, but we're looking and working closely with them, which is how we learned a little bit more about which languages we really need to strive for for material translation, and um, that's helping guide some of these next steps that we're trying to undertake with respect to what projects and what city citywide kind of initiatives we have underway that need translation. But I'll be candid and say that the other um, thing we're really trying to look candidly at is not only the, the translation piece, which is becoming easier as we do it more. We know which organizations can turn effective translations around quickly. We're learning more about some tele kind of language options so that if folks call into either our water department or here, we might be able to in real time work with uh, folks who may have language barriers, but there's a distribution problem. And so one of the things I think we're always eager for help on is, um, you know, how do we get this material out? Because we can put it on Facebook, we can put it on our website, we can plead with the media when we do media advisories to share it as broadly as possible on their newscasts and on their websites. But I think there's probably more effective strategies that we're trying to learn as we learn um, on how to distribute material. So that's, you know, that's an area where maybe we have a blind spot right now and I think we want to get better. Luckily, um, the division directors uh, and Director Spencer support this, I mean, very widely and the project managers are all incredibly supportive of working with me and vice versa to make sure we get better at this. So that's kind of a snapshot of how we've tried to get better over the last, you know, 18 months and hopefully the next uh, year can prove to be even more successful on that. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bose, questions, comments? I wanted to quickly follow up with that. That was a great um, response, and I appreciate the, the kind of work that the uh, department has put into this. One thing I wanted to suggest is um, building on some of the lessons from uh, the success of the, the COVID vaccination, the BIPOC, um, especially with the, the new American community. Uh, one of the things that was really effective was partnering with, uh, I think it's called the Multicultural Language Liaison or something like that. And what they actually put out was a series of um, videos, short videos uh, that were informative. And I think that also addressed the, the fact that, you know, when I think about some of the communication that goes out from um, the department, you're quite right. There's the kind of the regular, information about parking vans or you know, kind of st uh, street cleaning or different things that comes out. Sometimes it's also, I think, really important. You know, I noticed um, that when you sent out the little info sheet today about yesterday's, I think you sent it out, right? That, that, That's right. Or maybe it was in front or something. I can't remember. When the thing just went out about, you must have sent it out. I never sent it out. <laughs> the infrastructure, right? That's right. And I was thinking like, you know, that was such an effective 
form of communication that was immediate. And I remember you doing something very similar when we had the um, the water shut off. It was like in, it must have been in uh, the fall of 2019 when there was the the break in um, in the South End. Yeah. And there's a lot of misinformation that, especially on social media, that, that goes out really quickly. And so I think having like nimble ways of communicating uh, what is actually going on, because of course it's so rife with, with people making assumptions or sort of jumping to conclusions. And I think having, um, having translated materials is great, but of course within certain communities there can also be a, a lack of, um, of uh, literacy even within native languages. And so, so that's something I know has been effective um, in the past. But I, I, I do think that that like timely communication is really, uh, really a, a, an important part of this. So, so yeah, just uh, commending your efforts in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, yeah, I mean, that was going to ask the same question that was already asked. <laughs> so uh, I don't have anything at the moment, but um, I do appreciate that explanation because I'm also new to Burlington. So um, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll have more once I get to read through the rest in further detail. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Overby. Um, I just have a quick question about what's the name of the software that you're using for the asset management? Or the asset management software we selected through a competitive process is called ViewWorks. V -U -E Works. The U Works. I think you told me that like a couple months ago, but yeah. I just wanted to make sure. And is that tied into the GIS data that the city is using? Yes. So it's very, very, yeah, very spatially oriented where things are, yeah. click on the item. It's like the way the water uh, resources have the fire hydrant flushing where you can look and see where the hydrants are and which ones have been flushed or Correct. green and which ones haven't or red, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's going to be, yes. it'll be very helpful for you and it would be really interesting, I think, um, ultimately for the public to be able to, again, get, see the value of their, their money. So, and I'll look this over in yes. more detail. Great. Norm's team is managing the implementation of asset management and uh, Norm, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I would just say that asset management really is the, the intellect to informing our capital planning function, but it also ties back the maintenance to the capital investment. So the idea is between asset management and capital investment planning, you ultimately have the highest and best use of the money that's available to us and addresses the highest priorities and concerns. Obviously, when it comes to capital, there is significant costs that go with operating all these systems. and. It's not likely that we're going to see all the money that we need to have things 100% in terms of capital reinvestment. But if you're doing proper maintenance investment, proper capital investment, you're minimizing those costs and you're providing the highest value in terms of those systems being available to the public. And I think that's ultimately what you want to arrive at is providing the highest value at the least cost while not um, overburdening the taxpayers. So. That's uh, the idea is those two together kind of help us arrive at a better place than say where we didn't have all that right information. We're investing a lot of money in capital but not doing enough preventive maintenance. So the overall cost of ownership is significantly higher. Mm -hmm. So these systems really pay for themselves over a long haul, but it does take a significant front end investment. It does take staff time and money to really pull it together. But I think we're on the right path and uh, so you'll, you'll see, I guess I, what I'd say is a brighter future in terms of Burlington, in terms of the assets we own and how they're used. So it's a really positive thing. I, I, I totally agree with you. And one of the amazing things about it, I think, is that you're gonna actually know, um, you know those kind of things or those looming big costs in the future. Uh, th this is really, I, I hate to refer to the condo situation in, in Florida, but that really is a problem for, uh, when you when you when you just do things as they come uh, come along, so you're going to have in, at any point in time you should once it's all been front loaded, and I know it's going to be a lot of work for you guys, but you're going to be able to at any point project those things that are going to be the big the, the big whack 
before we have to uh, sc scuttle around, you know, three years ahead of time You'll and try see, to try to borrow the money. You'll see less reactive response to capital challenges. You'll you'll see less of emergency response and more of planned or sequenced work. Right. But that doesn't mean it won't go away because there's a significant backlog of capital. But but the fact that, of it, the it, not doing it in an emergency because you really have have yeah, documented you, you, the projections yeah, of when the money is going to need to come due and that's where yeah. um, condo associations really are. there's no requirement of any of those to do that so people can buy a condominium and the association will have no idea which these looming things are depending on how the act how, how the the condo board who are volunteers do it so I, I really am supportive yeah, of that what is you're a doing hidden and cost it and um, I'm glad that you, you've taken many years to get here. I've seen that you're working on your way, and so I'm I'm very excited about what you're doing with that, and we'll continue to want to see how how excited you are about making it work. And you can do demonstrations for us at some point. Well, asset management system will really inform our staff in real time the condition of situations and in, in systems themselves, but also capture the the intelligence that you capture when you go and you manage those systems or do work on those systems. So, you know, you have one person working on it one day and the next day another person's working on it. Do they know, have they talked to each other about what they've done? Do they, are they making the highest and best use of their time? These systems will kind of avoid kind of duplication of work or things that didn't get any care at all. So you will have the person who's doing the work can actually make that data into the, put the data into the system and then uh, everybody else is informed about it. So yes. they'll get value from other people's input to conditions and how things Absolutely. are. Absolutely. It's it really, it's just, it's, it's a complete, you yeah. know, you know, innovation yeah. that's going to make a big difference. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So thank you very much for all that work. Yeah. We're excited to bring it to you in a couple months when we get this thing live. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Vice Chair on the yeah. I, I'm so excited about this asset, asset management tool. Um, I really think it's going to be fantastic. Um, do you have a sense, you know, I know anytime you start a new technology, there are hiccups and bumps. Do you have a sense of when you will be able to, like, really come back to us or to um, the public and say, this is the value of this tool where we're seeing, um, you know, able to capture not just the data, but where we were saving, you know, some money. It's so there's there's cost savings, but then there is the delivery of the services that the public expects and needs. Mm -hmm. That is a, that's value, and it can't you can't put a dollar value on a building that's in service or a water line that's in service that didn't fail. But uh, certainly there is save cost savings. Can we put a f exact figure on it? I don't know, but. But there's value, and I think it's it's also using that lexicon. How do we explain the value if we if there's right. not a monetary? Well, we're we're trying to right. put our head around, I guess, kicking this off and gathering the information and, and kind of setting the table. And I'm six months from to now. do all that <laughs> metrics, Sorry. but uh, without question, yeah. those metrics are important to selling the idea, understanding the the value of that, but also just communicating to the public. Where is their money going, and what does it what's it done for them? And is this is this, in their opinion, the highest and best use of the funds that we have, or is there a different set of priorities that want, people want us to consider? Mm -hmm. Part of it is they, they you just got to have these systems for them to know and understand the decisions they're making when it comes to, you know, master planning or any of these things. Mm -hmm. What what goes what costs go with those decisions? Are you prepared to accept those costs? Mm -hmm. So it. it it's just more information for people to really soundly make best choices and decisions based on what their values and interests are. Mm -hmm. Well, and then back to the priorities and, and maybe even back further to, to Martha's um, presentation, um, in looking at the deferred maintenance. Um, so with this system, how and who helps set the priorities? Um, will this help at least maybe identify on some level then what are the priorities that are starting to rise to the surface at least by a monetary value or by this is deferred maintenance, is, is it gonna have that capacity? And then where's the human interface um, with, I don't know, is it committee or cross-section, right. cross-division, whatever? Well, it's, a, it's community decisions. There's 
your elected officials, the mayor, there's council, there's the commissions, there's members of the public to provide feedback to staff about what their needs and interests are, staff and their professional opinions on how to take care of these systems, what recommendations they may have. So it all feeds into those decisions, all those elements feed into those decisions. So not one person is making these decisions, it's, it's the community as a whole with different levels of focus or interest. Right, yeah. I guess I was getting more to the kind of granular piece of, right. of that priority list. Right. Like, yeah, so, you know, yeah, how, how are we moving? So, it, you know, staff would put together, assemble kind of a, I guess a system or a matrix of decision making, you know, like when we look at capital committee, we're looking at, you know, does it avoid costs? Does it uh, respond to protecting against liability? Does it use other people's money, leverage other money mm -hmm. to save costs to the city? Um, does it respond to um, communities of, of at risk? For instance, uh, sidewalk system. Uh, we're looking for a higher priority for senior housing, uh, walking to school, those sort of things. Um, and one of the kind of overlays to the sidewalk system is looking at are we inadvertently missing on uh, disadvantaged communities, whether it be a BIPOC community or people of financial disadvantage. You know, are we are we inadvertently not serving them well? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that that we're trying to do as staff to create policies that you, as a commission, or any other governing body within the city, can accept and appreciate and support. So I think it does start with staff on how those things are structured and organized. We're going to tell you how many water breaks we've had year after year and not have it take us a couple hours of manual staff time. That's great. Right? We're going to be able to trend the pavement condition index over years and see how are we meeting our 72 uh, pavement condition index ranking. Uh, you know, all that data is really going to help democratize and make transparent, you know, why we're making the decisions we're making collectively to better our city. Right. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. yeah. That's all. Thanks. Hey, thank you. I was going to um, touch on the same point, but I'm picturing, like, I don't know what the status of the BTV stat initiative is, but if that comes up, like, can you put this story together? And it sounds like you're, you're thinking along those lines as well. Yeah, to see the, the, the conversation at the last department head meeting by the mayor, and yeah. people are excited to get back into that, mm -hmm. deeper dive into that. Yeah, yeah. and we're, we're, we're working in directions where we can quantify our Asset emergency management. costs going down and our yep. productive investments going without asset it being will be that tool. a long effort of manual time we need a system that's automated that gives us real-time data and not have us chasing our tail for data that by the time we generate it it's already moved and changed yeah so i love it spend too much time doing the manual counts now and it's not an efficient use of our staff time agreed Commissioner Matano. Yep. So will will that data portal be available to the public as well to analyze and even look at the nitty gritty, say pavement conditions on a given street and then correlate yeah, it to whatever? Is, is ultimately to make it uh, available to the public and, and they can draw their own conclusions and ask questions. Yeah. Some some data will be publicly accessible, other data sets public know. safety sensitivities, you know, yeah. utilities that can't be can't be readily available to the public right. that put put the public health and safety at risk. Right. So there are security issues with some of that information. Yeah. But yes, there are large data sets that we do want to make more publicly accessible. Right. Thank you all. Um, do we have any members of the public interested in speaking? Um, all right. Uh, Parting thoughts from the commission? All right, seeing none, there's no action necessary on this item at this time. I will close out agenda item seven and move forward to item eight, the minutes of the June meeting. A note on that is that uh, those that are eligible to vote on the minutes are limited to commissioners at that time that were present at the meeting, I believe. Um, even though some of our new commissioners might have been <laughs> participants in paying attention in that meeting, uh, 
we are in need of a, uh, a quorum of voters from commissioners that were present. Um, Commissioner Barr is absent, us leaving, I believe, four of us that mm-hmm. were at that meeting and eligible to vote yeah. on this. So we, we could so we can entertain a vote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there, I would welcome a motion. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the June 16th um, meeting. Motion for, from, all right, we have a mo- motion from Vice Chair O'Neill Vivanco and a second from Commissioner Bowes. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion around that motion? All right, we will go to a vote then. Commissioner Bose. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Overby. Aye. Vice Chair O'Neill Vaco. Aye. Aye for myself. The June minutes have passed four to zero. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, moving forward to item nine on the agenda, uh, the uh, director's report. Great. Thank you. Um, Apologies for it being omitted from the packet uh, this month. I I did print out copies and put them in front of you. Let me hit some key points here. First, a a very sad and tragic note that uh, our lead for our recycling uh, program, Marcus Westcott, uh, passed away unexpectedly uh, about 10 days ago. And um, he was a remarkable man who, got more compliments than you think would think would ever be possible for running uh, what is a, a collection program. Uh, his relationships with his customers, as he called them, uh, was very powerful. And there have been, I think, about 14 or so unsolicited um, memories uh, shared on Front Porch Forum over the last couple of days. Uh, and we are going to set up, uh, do a couple of things in his, in his memory. Uh, one is we are going to dedicate our new recycling truck to him uh, so that his uh, legacy can live on through our recycling program. Um, and his uh, son, who works for us on a temporary seasonal basis, we are collecting money uh, for his ongoing educational advancement. And so anybody who's interested in contributing uh, can uh, provide a, a donation through to uh, customer service here. And uh, we want to be supporting his son in his future career growth. Um, so, uh, r- very sad event, and um, I don't know. I think that the, the legacy that he left is is that in his team, the level of support and care and attention to their work and their customer facing approach will far outlive him. Um, but a real loss for all of us. Uh, Youth on Boards uh, was an item that we had talked about adding to this agenda. Um, I didn't add it to the agenda as a specific item, but I'm happy to discuss. Um, It has been put on the city's website through August 27th for youth to apply for this commission as well as other commissions. Uh, We did hear from the city attorney that this would be a non-voting seat for the Public Works Commission based on city ordinance and charter. Uh, and that any youth member who's interested in serving uh, can contact Lori Olberg in the clerk treasurer's office. Uh, August meeting, uh, we like to take off in August usually. Uh, we have met in August before where there's been pressing business. Uh, this, mo- this year, uh, I believe there will be pressing business. One item will be the timely vote on the sustainable infrastructure plan uh, as the plan is to go to council for their final vote before your September meeting. So the August meeting would be the only time you could weigh in prior to that. And second, related to the recent city place and uh, 100 Bank Street settlement that the city was a partner in helping broker. Uh, One of the key items of that settlement is a parking agreement uh, that uh, the city uh, would provide to uh, 100 bank for parking in the Lakeview and College garage. And we would need that approval in August as well. 
So uh, we should discuss at the end of this uh, whether that August 18th day works for a quorum of the count of the commission. Uh, Rail Yard Enterprise Project, uh, we've got continued good news here. Uh, we're going out within a week for the RFQ, a request for qualifications to get our design consultant on board. Um, Congressman Welch has tentatively secured $2 million of funding in the transportation bill. Whether that continues uh, through the House and Senate process remains to be seen, but uh, great to have our federal and state partners working to support us. Um, thanks to your review on the water rates, the council approved that, and as of July 1, our new water rates are in place. With the, uh, with the affordability programs and the rebates uh, that you all recommended approving. Uh, the Shelburne Street Roundabout, I'm pleased to report, is going to construction and should be under construction by next week. Uh, Pre-construction mobilization activities are actually underway now. Uh, around the site. Uh, this will be a two-year project requesting a bunch of patients, uh, but this is a good lead-in that part of what staff is looking at right now is the south end is going to be the center of multiple large transportation projects for the foreseeable future. From the Amtrak station, from Shelburne Street roundabout, to the Class 1 repaving of pretty much all the Class 1 streets next year, to the Champlain Parkway, to the Rail Yard Enterprise Project, to the Main Streets, Great Streets Project. It is gonna be a very difficult period. So what we are working on is a phasing plan for all of these projects, looking out seven or eight years to try to figure out the best way to align all these projects to minimize impact. We'll be wanting to meet with you in the next month or two to kind of go over that approach. Uh, we'll be talking to council as well uh, to, to minimize the impacts, uh, especially as the community is recovering from COVID. So uh, stay tuned for that. Did I miss anything? Uh, one item, um, Chapin mentioned this within our, his um, performance and the goals and objectives is the idea of promoting staff within the department. Uh, we fortunately had a promotion within the department where we had Corey Mims, who was a public works engineer, has been promoted to a senior public works engineer, filling that position that formerly held by Susan Molzon. So we're happy to have him filling that role. We'll be back filling his position as public works engineer and uh, likely probably another internal candidate moving up from an associate position to potentially this public works engineer position, depending on how it plays out. But we're happy to have the organizational structure we have to allow people these opportunities and uh, to be deeply invested in what we do. As you saw in Chapin's uh, communication, Corey's uh, hitting the road running. Uh, he's got rail yard enterprise assigned to him. He has the parkway assigned to him. And he also has passenger rail assigned to him. And both he and I are working closely together to transition him into that role that Susan formerly mm -hmm. filled. So obviously Susan's shoes are very big shoes to fill, but I think Corey would do an excellent job and we're happy to have him serving in that responsibility. So. Great. Thank you, uh, City Engineer Baldwin. I will just close by saying that uh, we had a pretty major storm last night. Uh, our wastewater plants, which had received a significant capital upgrade thanks to the voters' support in 2018 for the Clean Water Resiliency Plan, uh, our wastewater plants performed very well last night, uh, despite main plant treating over 10 million gallons. Uh, a mix of wastewater and stormwater. Uh, we did have three combined sewer overflows. Uh, we have five combined sewer overflow points within the system. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to um, commissioners if you're interested about the detail of the historic development of Burlington and how wastewater and stormwater were combined in the same collection system. Uh, for over a hundred years and how that legacy today is something that we are working to uh, improve to better steward the lake and other waterways. Um, but we have um, succeeded together to reduce uh, both the number of CSO points as well as the frequency that they uh, go off. And that is a collective work that we have done together, but we are not done as last night showed. We have more work to do and we look forward to uh, that ongoing partnership with you in the in the months ahead. 
with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions and maybe now would be a good time to check in on the August 18th date and whether that works for a quorum of the council, of the commission. Thank you. Yeah, it, August 18th works on my end. Um, we have one conflict I've heard of from Commissioner Kennedy, right? What do uh, others present feel on the, the 18th? Is that a, a viable option if we need it? Works for me. I'm going to be out of town, but I, I would try to call in if I could do that. It wasn't one of your travel days. Like You, you think it's, you could, uh, it, you could it, phone yeah, I, won't, I won't be on a travel day. I should not be on a travel day. I don't know that for sure. Waiting for the for sure getting across the Canadian border. So I should be in Canada. <laughs> so okay. I will try to call in on that night. Sure. Commissioner Works for me. Uh, Commissioner Bose, do you have a sense of your <coughs> potential availability August 18? As long as I can get back from Canada, then I should. I have to tell you. Like a 20% chance I can. So, yeah. No, I should be fine. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, commissioners, for that indulgence in August. Uh, we'll make sure to be prepared and make it as short as possible. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll go to Commissioner Communications. Welcome. Um, just by way of introduction, you, it, there's uh, sort of open uh, open time to comment on, on what's on your mind, if anything, or to um, respond to any follow up on uh, the director's report or other items. Uh, that said, let's uh, start with uh, Commissioner Overby. I just wanted to make one reminder for the people that are interested in the bike path on North Winooski and the process they're going through on the parking management planning. Um, the tomorrow they're going to have a second meeting about the parking management plan um, because one of the challenges is the parking along that neighborhood and that stretch of North Winooski. There's quite a concern about parking. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody's interested, it is going to be tomorrow night in the committee uh, at the conference room downstairs in City Hall. You can actually call in on the website as well uh, to do it. So you have a multiple ways of doing it. But it's going to be tomorrow, the 22nd of July at 6 o'clock, 6 to 8. And the website, if you want to get that information, is uh, burlingtonvt.gov slash dpw slash improvements. And all the file, all the documents are available there. Um, I just know I've had people ask me about what that was, and so I think there is interest, for, particularly for people that live in that neighborhood, and are wanting to see the bikes lanes go in. But they, we need to, we need to deal with the way that where people are going to park, in the uh, public parking and the private parking. So, just wanted people to know about that. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that and getting that word out, Mr. Kennedy. Have anything to add? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Commissioner Bose. Nothing for me, thanks. All right, Commissioner Mutanu. I'm good, thank you. All right, Vice Chair O'Neill Vivanco. Um, yeah, just a, a couple things. Um, not to totally geek out, but um, last night at dinner time during the storm, the topic of um, our dinner time conversation with my kids. <laughs> What, and my son's like two teenage friends over for dinner was like, was there going to be an overflow and what happens and why? Mm -hmm. um, we have combined, um, you know, wastewater sewer <laughs> service in parts of um, in parts of Burlington. So you at least have three um, male teenagers who are kind of fascinated by this and then horrified that people actually walk in the water when they're when they're floods. So anyway, um, we geek out in our family, but 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 really, like on a more serious note, I was really impressed that that there were only three. I mean, the rain was unbelievable. So I felt like we really saw, while there were some flaws, we really saw the kind of result of the investment in um, you know our, our improvements. So you know, hugs to Megan. Um, this is great. Um, two minor things. Um, one, um, uh, just in response to an email from a resident about um, painting of sharrows. Um, I think the, the resident 
included all of us. And I don't know what the um, um, kind of what the timeline is for um, doing the, the right. painting of the shadows. I've seen them in the spring. Maybe it comes later. I don't know. But their concern was that that painting comes too late into the, the biking season. I don't know if we can we can try to address that. I told them to do C click fix, but I think um, you know for future planning, if there's some if there's a way that we can um, get some of that um, that paint on the ground yeah. earlier in the season, that would be great. It's a fair point. We'll get you updates on that. We have gotten our contract with our vendor for FY22 starting July 1. So uh, we should have those being refreshed imminently, I will confirm. Okay. And then one other thing from another um, resident. Um, and this is, I, I just feel really sensitive to everybody during the pandemic. I feel like we're all, we're all fragile and we just need to be kind to one another. Um, this was a resident um, who has um, resident-only parking um, um, on Mansfield Ave and um, contractors came to the house and he moved his cars to the street but in the pandemic did not renew the resident parking stickers and got a ticket and was negotiating. The ticket got waived but um, he felt that the the tone of the form letter during the pandemic could have been different, mm -hmm. could have been a little bit more um, not um, not. It's your responsibility. It it is. I think he recognizes that. Um, but um, but that no one was going downtown. This resident is over sixty, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I know we do our best with customer service, um, and maybe this is just a one time moment um, but I think just recognizing the sensitivity of as we emerge from COVID and are emerging it's a process right um, that uh, some of some of our communications um, may need to be a little bit more nuanced or understand that um, you know some of the panic comes out is is from the past 16 months so that's all. That's all I need to communicate. <laughs> Fair statement. Uh, we have now taken over parking enforcement. And for some, for new commissioners who may not know, from the police department as part of the realignment of police services. So while we had historically uh, set up the regulations and installed the signage, the actual enforcement happened with another department. Now that is part of our department and division director. Jeff Paget, who's not here tonight, um, is now overseeing the whole soup to nuts uh, regulation of our parking enforcement. So to that end, I will follow up with Jeff, see what we can do. He is trying to work with the attorneys and the other partners within the city to give us that flexibility to be more customer centered. A lot of our uh, communication is uh, somewhat bureaucratic because it, it it follows ordinance and it uh, needs to be fairly uh, delivered to all members of our community so that we are not treating anybody preferentially. That said, we really do want to be running a program that is understandable and uh, customer facing. So. Yeah, I mean, I think getting a letter from the city attorney about your parking makes you feel like, <laughs> like it's just a parking decal. <laughs> So again, I think that yeah. you know the moment in time, and as we transition, yeah. what we can do better, we can do better. Yeah. Okay, so noted. Thanks. Thank, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, couple of last thank you, and I uh, had a question last time on the, the status of the uh, the um, detour on Battery Street. Yeah. That's looking great with the cones there. Thank you. Um, another sort of similar um, traffic calming opportunity, if you will, I think might exist on uh, Colchester Avenue. And I'm, I'm gonna follow up with our our planning team and just see what the status is, but I was going downhill towards um, the city of Winooski recently, turned right on Chase Street, and I sort of knew to watch out for the painted, although faint, faded paint uh, bulb outs there. 
and probably you know the car behind me just hugs the curb and just uh, like it, like there's nothing there. If there was ever an opportunity, I know that we have an outstanding request to look into the status of replacement bollards on South there, Union. There, there will be uh, quick build materials going in at that intersection. Fantastic. This year, and we'll get a status update. Okay. Yeah. That all that all sounds great. Um, yeah, nothing further on my end. So I will said close out the commissioner communications and go to the last item on our agenda adjournment and next meeting dates uh should we go ahead and call it august 18th let's do it all right entertain a motion to that effect um i'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting with the next meeting date set at august 18th all right thank you for that motion I'll second. All right. Thank you. We have a motion from Vice Chair O'Neill Vivanco, a second from Commissioner Muntanu. Is there any discussion around that motion? I have a comment that's yes. not about before the adjournment. I meant to mention, I just want to express an appreciation for the, the camera person from Community TV, CCTV, Charlie Giannone, who's here, and, is, and there's been challenges with going from the the web only zoom system to having zoom and a live camera and the technology to be able to do that and i just want to commend him you charlie for doing that work and how that is so important for the public to be able to see these meetings and your willingness to you know deal with all the challenges of the new uh the new technologies of now not only doing the zoom and and the camera and the, all of our microphones so i just really wanted to mention that we're back getting to uh, a hybrid situation which is far more challenging than it was even though it was very challenging before so thank you so much for that work i really it's definitely a team effort there's about eight people at cctv working on it and it's an ongoing situation so things are going to change and modify over time but thank you for saying that very important that the public has the ability to watch these meetings and I appreciate your work and everybody's work at CCTV Thank you. so now we can vote on the <laughs> all right uh, so we have a motion to adjourn that has been seconded is there any discussion around that motion all right I will call roll for make sure we got everybody Commissioner Bose peace out from the west coast all right thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> Commissioner Muntanu yes Vice Chair O'Neill Vivanco. Aye. Commissioner Overby. Aye. Commissioner Kennedy. Aye. Aye for myself. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Two Good hours. evening. Well done.